Good morning, everyone. So today I will talk about the bioequivalence considerations for conducting bridging studies with generic orally inhaled and nasal drug products. So before I begin, I would like to point out that for the term bridging studies used in my presentation, uh, we're using a loose term here. So we're using this term to describe the additional studies conducted to support the changes made to the uh, or proposed to the test product after B studies are completed prior to end approval. And we're not talking about dissolution studies as you sometimes see in other uh, types of drug products such as the oral tablets or oral capsules. So a disclaimer, uh, this re presentation ref only reflects my own opinion and should not be construed to represent the FDA's views or policies. So here's an outline of my presentation. So I will first have an overview about the agency's bioequivalence or B recommendations for orally inhaled and nasal drug products, or OINDPs. For example, um, I'll talk about the uh, B recommendations for nasal spray suspensions, for meter dose inhalers, or MDIs, or uh, dry powder inhalers, or DPIs. Then I'm going to move on to talk about considerations for conducting BE bridging studies. And this will include when and why to conduct uh, BE bridging studies, and how to decide whether bridging studies are needed, and if needed, what type of bridging studies are needed. And then I'm going to move on to talk about the considerations for conducting BE studies, as well as how to submit BE bridging studies. Then I'm going to talk, move on to the conclusion. So as Dr. Newman mentioned in his presentation earlier, the FDA has a weight of evidence approach for demonstrating uh, bioequivalence for the nasal and orally inhaled drug product. So an example here is for the nasal spray suspensions. So uh, this weight of evidence approach utilizes in vitro studies to demonstrate equivalent in vitro performance from cokinetic or PK study to demonstrate equivalent systemic exposure, and comparative clinical endpoint study to further support the equivalent local delivery for a test product that has demonstrated formulation and device similarity. And for the in vitro studies, uh, there are six studies recommended for the uh, uh, nasal spray suspensions, which include the single activation content, or SAC, droplet size distribution by laser diffraction, or DSD, drug in small particles, droplet size distribution by cascade impactor, or CI, spray pattern, plume geometry, and priming and repriming studies. The agency's B recommendations for the MDI product are similar to that of the nasal spray suspension product, which include in vitro, uh, in vitro studies, PK studies, uh, from called dynamic or PD study or comparative clinical endpoint studies, as well as formulation and device similarities. And for the in vitro studies recommended for the MDI product, this include the single activation content, the aerodynamic particle size distribution or APSD, spray pattern, plume geometry, and priming and repriming study. As for as mentioned in Dr. Newman's uh, presentation before, the priming and repriming studies is recommended if the RLD also recommend this study. For the DPI product, the uh, agency's B recommendation is similar to that of the MDI and nasal spray suspension product. And this also includes in vitro PK, PD, or clinical endpoint study, as well as formulation and device similarity. And the in vitro study recommended for the DPI product include the SEC as well as APSD study. So overall, for all the in vitro PK, PD, as well as clinical, comparative clinical endpoint studies, we prefer you to use the test product that, re that represent a proposed to be marketed or commercial product. However, at the same time, we understand that in certain cir circumstances, Changes in a test product, uh, which I will give you more examples in the next slide, may occur after the B studies are completed. So depending on the specific change or changes, bioequivalence between the post-change test product and the reference product may be established by repeating the complete set of recommended B studies between the post-change test product and RLD. 
And also depending on the specific change or changes, uh, you may conduct in vitro or in vivo breeding studies between the post-change and test product and the LLD product. So as I mentioned earlier, here are a few examples of changes that are proposed for a test product. Examples for changes in a device. For example, change in the material in the meter dose pump for a nasal spray product. Incorporation of a dose counter for, say, a meter dose inhaler. And change in dip, dip tube length for the nasal spray product. And examples for manufacturing process change include, for example, a change in the filling instrument, changes in blending time, and examples for manufacturing side change, uh, such as change in the manufacturing, type, manufacturing, manufacturing site and also addition of a new manufacturing site. Examples for changes in formulation, such as change in overage. And also for all these changes, it may the test product proposed may contain one or more than one change. So how to decide whether, if you have a proposed changes, whether breeding studies are needed, and if needed, what type of breeding studies are needed? So this actually depends on the specific change that, that you propose. And since currently the uh, FDA does not have a guidance regarding what breeding studies to conduct for the nasal and oral inhaled drug product, I'd like to give you a few case studies so that you can have a general idea of uh, what was recommended before in certain, uh, cer in certain cases. And before I start, I would like to emphasize that um, besides the BE bridging studies, there may be additional CMC documentations or studies that are needed to support the proposed changes made in your uh, test product. But for the scope of my presentation, I will only focus on the B BE bridging studies. So the first case study is about nasal product that has a change in device. And for this proposed change, there are actually four different uh, changes proposed for the device, which includes changes in the bottle dimension, change in actuator skirt length, change in dip tube length, and change in the pump material. Based on the specific proposed changes, um, the agency recommended an applicant to conduct in vitro B studies comparing the post-change test product with the RLD product. And the recommended in vitro studies include the SEC, uh, the droplet size distribution by laser diffraction, and spray pattern studies. The second case study is about an, an MDI product that proposed the incorporation of a dose counter. So according to the product specific guidance of this MDI product, if the RLD product has a dose counter, then the test product should have a dose counter as well. At the time of the B study, um, the RLD product does not yet have a dose counter. So the B study was co conducted without a dose counter. However, after the, the B studies were completed, the RLD included a dose counter. So the, this applicant proposed to add a dose counter as well. Based on the proposal, uh, the agency recommended a, the applicant to conduct at minimum in vitro B studies comparing the post-change test product with a dose counter to the RLD product with a dose counter. And the recommended B studies include the SAC, the APSD, spray pattern, plume geometry, and priming and repriming studies. In addition, the agency notified the applicant that upon review of the in vitro bridging data with the dose counter, additional studies may be requested as well. So for the case study number three, it's about a DPI product that proposed a manufacturing change. So this, for this product, the applicant proposed to change in the filling instrument. And based on the, uh, uh, the proposed change, uh, the agency recommended the applicant to conduct the in vitro studies, which include the SEC and AP studies, APSD studies, comparing the post-change test product to the RLD product for each strength. And if you're familiar with the uh, uh, product-specific guidance for DPI product, uh, the guidance recommends using three different flow rates for each of the SEC and APSD studies. For for the pivotal in vitro B studies. And for this breeding uh, B studies, uh, the agency recommends to conduct the SAC and APSD study using one single flow rate instead of three, uh, three flow rates. 
So that's all for the case studies. So now you may wonder, um, so I have a test product that my proposed changes are different from the case studies that you listed. Or I don't know if my proposed changes have the exact same details as compared to the case studies you listed. So what do I, what do, I do? So the agency can help to provide specific recommendations regarding the bee breeding studies regard for, your, um, for your own test product. And um, if, as you may already hear multiple times in today's uh, presentation, if the changes are made prior to your end of submission, you may discuss with the agency either in controlled correspondence or in a pre-end meeting request. And if the proposed changes are made, or if you have questions about what to do after the end has been submitted, you may contact the regulatory product manager or the RPM to figure out a path forward. So here are a few considerations when you conduct a breeding studies. So typically, uh, we recommend in vitro bee breeding study to be conducted. However, uh, depending on the type and the number and specific changes you propose, as well as the bee breeding studies that you already submitted to uh, the, and, and the application, uh, the agency may recommend additional bee breeding studies, such as in vivo bee breeding studies, to be conducted as well. In addition, we recommend you that in your bee breeding studies, you use the bat test batches that include all the changes that you propose. In addition, for how to conduct a bee breeding studies, we recommend we refer you to the product specific guidance for details regarding the bee studies, unless the agency provides specific recommendations for your situation. And regarding the numbers of batches and number of units per batch to be used in in vitro bee studies, uh, we recommend you to use at least three batches of the post chain product versus three bat at least three batches of the unexpired hourly product with no fewer than 10 units from each batch, unless the agency provides specific recommendations for your situation. So after you conduct uh, your bee breeding studies, here are a few tips for how to submit it in your end application. First of all, we would like you to specify the changes that you propose for your test product. And this includes the changes made between the test product used in each of your in vitro and in vivo bee study to that of the to be marketed or commercial drug product. In addition, we would like you to specify the details of the change that you propose, irrespective of the degree of the changes. So in certain situations, you may think, oh, this change is so minor, I don't need to mention about that to the agency. But however, sometimes during the end of review, the reviewer may find out, find this out, and they may consider that, no, this is not a minor change. We need you to conduct some bee breeding studies, so that's the situation that you may want to avoid. In addition, it's very important that when you communicate with the agency, either in control correspondence or pre end meeting requests, uh, and also in the end of submission, when you ask the agency about uh, what, uh, if, and what breeding studies are needed in your situation, you, will, you may want to specify all the details about the proposed changes so that the agency can better help you to provide some idea of, about what breeding studies are needed. In addition, uh, in your end of submission, please provide justifications of why certain breeding studies were conducted could support the changes. And if you have previous communication with the agency regarding this issue, you can reference that in your end of submission. And also for the data uh, regarding the, B, uh, the BE breeding studies, please provide all the recommend, uh, relevant documentations just as those that you would provide for a pivotal BE studies. For example, um, the summary tables in both Word and PDF formats, the study protocols and reports, and if you're con conducting the breeding B studies using a study method that are different from what you have done for your pivotal uh, B studies, please also submit your method validation report. And uh, other documents to submit include uh, the standard operation, op operating procedures, or SOPs, certificate analysis, or COAs, for the test and reference product batches that you use for your B breeding studies and also the uh, study data set in SAS uh, transport format. And if you 
think that uh, no bridging studies is needed for your situation. You can also provide justification to the agency to explain why you think no bridging studies are needed. And the review will take uh, that into consideration. So for conclusion, um, I know I talked a lot about bridging studies, but um, we, for all the in vitro PK, PD, and comparative clinical endpoint studies, we still prefer and we highly recommend you to use the test batches that represent the proposed to be marketed or commercial product. And if you uh, propose changes made to your test uh, product, such as in from device, from formulation, or manufacturing perspective, breeding studies may be needed. And regarding if and which breeding study are needed for your um, test product, the agency can provide specific recommendations. And you can either communicate to us prior to the end of submission through controlled cor correspondence or pre-end meeting request. Or after end of submission, you can contact the regulatory product manager to find a path forward. So that's, that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much for